So right now, if you're listening, the price is going to be $169. And it's going to stay that way until I manage to lose the weight that I've committed to lose. Uh, please do not send cookies. So that's just cheating. Welcome to episode 15 of the Canadian Couch Potato Podcast, where we help you become a better investor with index funds and ETFs. I'm Dan Bordelotti. In this episode, we're going to explore the appeal of simplicity in investing. This is a theme that I've returned to again and again in the last few years, but it wasn't always one that appealed to me. Back when I started writing about investing, I spent a lot of time agonizing over small details like what was an optimal asset allocation or how could you reduce the fees in your portfolio to the absolute lowest level. Now, don't get me wrong, details and subtleties are important in investing, as they are in many other areas of life, but focusing too much on small decisions can often distract you from much more important ones. There's also a danger of making fees the only criterion in your investing decisions, instead of just one of several things that you need to consider when building and maintaining a portfolio. Few people understand these ideas more deeply than John Robertson, the author of an excellent book called The Value of Simple, A Practical Guide to Taking the Complexity Out of Investing, which has just been published in a revised second edition. John has a really interesting background. He holds a PhD in medical biophysics, and he works as a science writer and editor, and he's entirely self-taught as an investor. He was blogging before most people even knew what that term meant, and you can still find him at holypotato.net, which I should say is a name that has no connection to the couch potato strategy, even though these days that's often what he writes about. Now, as you might expect from someone with a science background, John is rigorous and very detail-oriented, but he too has recognized that in investing, there are always trade-offs between cost and complexity. Usually lowering your costs means more work on your part, so the cheapest solution isn't always the right one for you. John has also done a really excellent job laying out the practical steps that you need to follow to actually open accounts and buy index funds and ETFs. And that's one of the reasons that I've recommended his book to so many of my own readers who understand the theory but need some help putting it into practice. And to take that to the next level, John has recently adapted the book into an online course called Practical Index Investing for Canadians. To continue with this theme of simplicity, following the interview with John, I'm going to take a detailed look at the brand new Vanguard Asset Allocation ETFs. These innovative new products, which were just launched in late January, are a family of ETFs that hold a mix of stocks and bonds, and they allow you to build an elegant index portfolio with just a single ETF and at very low cost. But first, my conversation with John Robertson. My guest on the podcast today is John Robertson, author of The Value of Simple and the creator of a new online course for index investors. John, welcome to the show. Ah, Thanks for having me out, Dan. All right. So I wanted to ask you about the origin of the book. You wrote the first edition back in 2014. Uh, So why don't you tell us a little bit about your motivation for writing it? Well, it's really to try to answer the question of how do I invest? Because I would talk to people, you know, investing is important. Or I would be in some random debate on my blog about renting versus buying and saying, well, you know, the opportunity cost your money is six, seven, eight percent. And people go, oh, my savings account doesn't pay that. How do I get that? And, well, you got to invest. That's how you do it. And then, of course, the follow up question is, how do I invest? And so I really wanted to go through the steps of how do you actually invest? Because there's a ton out there that says index investing is great. Index investing is going to outperform a lot of active, all the active strategies, whatever version of the efficient market hypothesis you want to use. And if you're already an active investor, then it's a very simple thing to switch over and say, okay, I'll stop doing this thing that I'm doing. And instead I'm going to go off and buy some index funds. And I know how to buy funds. So I just buy index funds instead of the funds I'm buying already. But if you're a new investor, that doesn't really help you. So you don't need as much of a introduction or hit over the head with the evidence of why index investing is great. You just want to invest. And then how do you actually do it? How do you do all of those sort of mundane things like open an account, actually create an order, track your order for taxes if you're not in a tax in a tax-free savings account or RSP. Uh, How do you know what a tax-free savings account or RSP is? And then how do you stick with it for you know your investing career, your entire lifetime basically? 
Yeah, it's one of these things that uh, I think a lot of us understand the theory behind index investing. But one of the challenges that uh, I hear from people all the time is, okay, I get the idea, but how do I get started? And even on my own side, I have these model portfolios um, and different products that people can use, but there isn't a lot of information on the specifics of how to do it. And one of the reasons why I've recommended your book to a lot of my own readers and listeners is because it includes you know, step-by-step instructions on how to open an account, purchase your funds, and get started. So I thought we could walk through the different options and we can talk a little bit about um, the different ways people can implement an index portfolio. Now, in the first edition of the book, you looked at three different options, which just happened to correspond to the three model portfolio options that I offer on my blog, and that is the Tangerine Investment Funds, the TD E-Series Index Mutual Funds, and then purchasing ETFs. And in your case, the instructions are specific to Quest Trade, the online brokerage. In the new edition of the book, which just came out this year, uh, you've added a fourth option, which is robo-advisors. So why don't we just walk through each of those options? We can talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each, and we can help people make a decision about which one might be appropriate for them. Yeah. And so there's a good reason why we chose those four options. I mean, both of us sort of hit on them uh, and other authors all over the web too, because they represent uh, really efficient or optimal combinations of cost and complexity. So there are other banks and institutions that offer all-in-one funds, but tangerines are the cheapest all-in-one funds. So the cost is the lowest and it's also very easy to use. Yeah, so let's start with Tangerine because I think that's really the best place for a lot of people to start. Um, I know what I was attracted to about Tangerine. Uh, not only are they, as you said, like sort of the cheapest all-in-one mutual fund solution, but I really like the simplicity and straightforward nature of them. I mean, they include. Canadian stocks, U.S. stocks, international stocks, Canadian bonds. That's it. There's no exotic asset classes. There's no complicated structures to them. They're very plain vanilla. So why don't you talk about um, what type of investor uh, would be appropriate uh, for starting with something like Tangerine? So Tangerine is still a do-it-yourself investment option. So if you want more handholding, if you don't want to deal with this at all, if you just lock up mentally at the thought of having to control your own money and make these investments, uh, then you're going to want to go with a full-service uh, provider. But if you are looking to do a, have a do-it-yourself portfolio, but you want to do it in a very simple, hands-off way, and you want, particularly now in a world where robo-advisors exist, you want one with a little bit more history or a linkage to a big bank because you may not necessarily uh, know what's going to happen with the robo-advisor space, which is a little newer, still evolving, uh, then Tangerine is a great way to go. And there's a lot of things to praise about Tangerine. They are going to have the highest cost of the options that we're going to talk about here, but you do get some value there. And that's actually where the title of the book comes from. It's the value of simple is because by paying a little bit more for these all-in-one funds, it makes your life simpler. And also the user interface for Tangerine is very simple and straightforward. So when you go to make a purchase in Tangerine and you want to buy that fund, you only have the one option. You don't even have to pick a fund to begin with. That fund choice is made for you at the time you open the account and then you're locked in until you go through some hoops. And then at the same time that you're making that purchase, you'll right away see hey, do you want to make this an automatic purchase? Maybe every week, bi-weekly, monthly, you can start contributing and you don't have to send in a separate form or call someone. It's right there in the same order entry screen and really reinforces the idea that, you know, you should just pay yourself first, just automate this, make it really simple. And Tangerine is great at making it simple. Yeah, we should say in terms of the cost, the the funds are 1.07%, which, you know, by index fund standards might be on the pricey side, but compared to what most people are paying for their investments, it's quite low. Uh, And I agree with you totally on the behavioral side that they really do encourage regular savings, uh, which is something that's really important. Um, One thing I'll add as well, in my experience, their customer service is pretty good in the sense that they... um, 
the only uh, funds that they offer are these index funds. And so they have no incentive at all to nudge you towards active and more expensive funds, which is not necessarily the case even with TD, who we'll get to next. So let's jump to the next one, which is the TD E-Series funds. The TD E-Series index mutual funds have been around for a very long time. Now, I think the oldest ones are from 1999 or 2000, which is pretty old by index fund standards. Um, they're about half the cost of TD on a sort of weighted basis. You can probably build a portfolio for about 0.45, 0 0.5% Yeah, right so. about there, yeah. Yeah. So why don't we talk about when it would make sense to go from a sort of one fund simple tangerine solution to a multiple fund solution with TD? Well, I mean, the, the very simple answer is when you're willing to put in a little bit more work because it is going to take more work. Uh, the TD has uh, two different ways of buying these TD series funds and we'll sort of discuss some pros and cons of the two different ways in a sec. Uh, but – Either way you go, you're going to have to buy likely four funds. Uh, both Dan and I have four TTE series funds making up our model portfolios. And so that's what you're going to be looking at to uh, put together a TTE series fund portfolio. So you're going to have to decide on your asset allocation, split your funds up. If you're going to automate it, you're going to have to set up four automatic purchases and then from time to time do the rebalancing yourself. The upside of that is it allows you a little bit more customization. So we talked about Tangerine. You only have a limited – there's three choices for balanced funds with TD. If you want to, you can go you know, 90 percent stocks, 10 percent bonds or something, which is an option that's not available at TD. Um, but as you said, you have to put in a little bit more work to get those purchases made every month. You can make automatic contributions but you have to make them to each of the individual funds. So there's just more moving parts to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So let's jump to, to what you mentioned earlier. Um, there are two different ways to buy the E-series funds. And one is directly through TD, uh, through a bank branch, through a TD mutual funds account. And the other one is through their online brokerage account, um, TD Direct Investing. So why don't you talk about the two different options, which one you prefer and why? Yeah. So – Either one at the end of the day is going to let you buy TD E-Series funds and some people prefer one or the other. I quite strongly prefer TD Direct Investing and it's the one that I use as the example walkthrough for the book and the course. Uh, part of it is because the regular TD mutual funds account that you can go to a branch and open or you might already have if you are working with a branch-based advisor slash salesperson, uh, that account can hold only TD's other series of mutual funds. So – be able to hold the E-series funds, you have to send in this conversion form and it takes a couple of weeks. Um, then there's some other user interface issues that I really dislike on the TD mutual fund side. So when you go to make a purchase, uh, on the TD direct investing side, you type in a fund code and then you will see a confirmation of the name of the fund. So you type in a fund code and then if you see the fund name you're expecting, you know that you've done it right. With the TDE series, you're selecting the funds from a dropdown. So if you're, for example, looking to buy the TD Canadian index fund, there are actually several varieties of TD index funds available from TD, or TD Canadian index funds, I should say. And you go through and there's the TD Canadian index fund, the TD Canadian Index Fund dash I, the TD Canadian Index Fund dash E. And you have to select the one that has the dash E at the end to know that you're buying the E-series. But it doesn't explicitly say E-series index fund. It doesn't say the MER of any of those uh, as you're selecting them and buying them. Uh, so there's a little bit more room there to make a mistake. And I have seen it happen from time to time where someone uh, uses a TD mutual funds account and tries to buy the low-cost TD E-series and ends up in perhaps the I-series instead, which is – basically the same fund, but with a slightly higher MER. And of course, if you go in branch and you say, I want to buy these TD series funds, well, the branch staff can't help you with that. And they they can sort of see what's in your account, but they can't make the transaction for you. And I don't know exactly what the limitation is in TD software, but I'm pretty sure that they are like blocked. Like they can't, even if they wanted to, uh, they couldn't help you buy the TDE series funds. So they might think that they're being helpful in helping you buy these funds and they end up putting you in the I series. Um, and then there's also the know your client form. So you're going to have to fill out this know your client form with a mutual fund account. And that's going to limit you in terms of what you're able to buy unless you answer all of the questions as risky as possible. And I mean, that's for your own protection and it's good. But if you decide to start buying your funds with all of the equity funds first, your portfolio is going to look very equities heavy and you'll get stopped. And then you'll have to go into branch and adjust your form until – 
the risk level of your portfolio, in other words, how much equities versus bonds, uh, comes back in line with that know your client form. And every time you visit the branch and have a branch staff member try to uh, help you with that, that's an opportunity for them to sell you on something. And I've had lots of stories of users of TD mutual funds. Yeah, we've all definitely heard these stories about yeah. TD is that as much as I love the E-series funds, uh, whenever we've you know, encourage people to go into the branch to buy them. Uh, I have heard many, many stories, and it sounds like you have as well, of TD employees trying to talk them out of them and pushing them towards the more expensive active funds. Yeah. So then the final thing, which is actually a big surprising one, is that uh, the TD mutual funds accounts can't hold cash. So that's first off a little bit of a brain twist if you want to ever do anything that involves needing cash or needing the branch staff to help you with something. So for example, if you have an RSP and you want to make a home buyer's plan withdrawal, that's a special kind of withdrawal. You have to go into the branch, get them to help you, but they can't help you with the TDE series funds. So first you have to convert the fund into something they can help you with, which means doing a switch transaction to like a new money market fund uh, within TD. So then the branch staff can help you with the money market fund which is totally not intuitive. But then even worse is if you do go and say, okay, I'm in my RSP and I want to sell this fund to cash as part of my rebalancing because I'll sell this and then buy that. Well, the account can't hold cash. So you hit sell and it actually deregisters the funds unless you have a uh, registered account linked, like an RSP savings account that can actually end up holding the cash within the RSP envelope. Yeah. And just so so listeners are clear on what that means, when you say deregister the funds, that means it's considered an RSP withdrawal, which means it's going to be taxable to you. Presumably and you lose the gonna, room. They're, yes. You lose the room forever. Uh, presumably they're going to withhold, you know, 20 to 30% tax as well. So it's a bit of a disaster unless you can get that reversed within a day or two. Yeah. yeah. So th this is sort of a human factors fail in my mind in terms of how the uh, interface and the whole setup was designed on the TD mutual funds. Uh, so I much prefer to point people towards the TD direct investing side because it's just a regular TD direct investing account. There's nothing special about it to be able to hold E-series funds. You can just hold E-series funds in any TD direct investing account. Uh, the other upside to the TD Direct Investing is that if you want to start moving into ETFs, you have the option right there. It's already a brokerage and you'll be at least somewhat familiar with how the order entry screens work and how the look and feel of the website is. Uh, even if you decide to go to a discount brokerage that allows you commission-free or reduced commission ETF purchases, at least you've seen what a brokerage looks like and you don't necessarily have to move if you're willing to pay the commissions. Uh, the downside to the TD Direct Investing route is the administration fee. So if you don't have $15,000 to invest within your household, they're going to charge you approximately $100 a year broken out quarterly. But this is avoidable. As long as you're investing at least $100 a month in a pre-authorized purchase plan within TD Direct Investing, they'll waive that fee for you. And, and that's not a hard hurdle to, to get over as long as you know that it's there. Okay, so let's talk about the third option, uh, which is ETFs um, through um, an online brokerage. In the book, you specifically um, give instructions for Questrade. So let's talk a bit about why uh, you have chosen Questrade as your example, and then we'll talk about building a portfolio with ETFs. Yeah, so the big reason I chose Questrade is because it's relatively user-friendly, but still has free-to-buy ETFs. Uh, so there should be air quotes, and you can't really see it in the... Uh, audio podcast here around free because they do charge what's called an ECN fee, which is a really tiny fee. It's just a few cents. Yeah, right? but it means that it's not completely free. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also uh, I should mention, I chose Questrade and wrote it all up in the book before I did this, but I did become a member of Questrade's referral program. So there is a minor conflict of interest there. Thank you for disclosing. <laughs> okay. Um, so Questrade is very popular with um, DIY investors for that reason. Um, it does offer the free ETF purchases. Um, so a lot of people will actually sort of skip past the Tangerine and uh, TDE series options and go right to that one. Because one of the big advantages, of course, that we didn't mention explicitly was mutual funds do not uh, charge commissions to buy and sell, whereas ETFs at most brokerages do. But once you eliminate that commission, like Questrade has, it really narrows the gap between uh, ETFs and the other options. So um, a lot of people will immediately look at ETFs as the place to begin, even if they have no experience whatsoever as an investor. So um, 
Are there any obstacles, though, that some of brand new novice investors uh, will have to overcome uh, if they're using ETFs for the first time? Absolutely. I mean, the section on using ETFs in the book is the longest one because it's the most complex. And sort of as you go from option to option to option, you're saving more and more money as the costs are going down. But that cost savings in dollars is offset by a cost in the behavioral complexity and the amount of time you need to spend to make all this work. So the order entry user interface request trade is going to be more complex or even with CD direct investing for an ETF than it would be for a mutual fund. The big reason is because with a mutual fund, you're allowed to own fractional units. So the price that the particular mutual fund happens to be trading at doesn't matter at all to you. If you have $100 to invest, you say, oh, great, $100 order, send. And then you buy $100. If you have $111.16, which I think is the example <laughs> I use in the book just to show completely arbitrary numbers work, you just put that in, you buy that much worth of the fund and it all gets invested. With ETFs, you have to buy in whole units. So first off, you have to do an extra step of division. Division isn't super complex. Any calculator or smartphone will be able to handle it, but it's one more thing to do. Yeah. So if you have $100 to invest, well, maybe that's a bad example because you probably are not investing really small yeah. amounts like that with ETFs. But let's say you had $1,000 to invest and the ETF trades at you know $24.73 right now. Well, first of all, there's more than one price for the ETF. There's a bid price yes. and a price. So you need to be able to know the difference between those two. And then you need to you know divide your $1,000 by the correct share price and and we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, then you need to round it off because you can't buy you know round only, it down round it down <laughs> only so if if the calculator says that you can buy twenty six point seven three shares you can't round that up to twenty seven you have to round it down to twenty six because you don't have enough cash to purchase twenty seven if that's the if you entered you know into the calculator the total amount of cash you had yeah that's exactly so, right so I mean this is not complex math but it is a little bit of additional work and brain power for people who maybe have never invested before. It's not necessarily the thing that you want to start with, although you you know, could certainly teach yourself if you put some effort into doing it. Yeah. And you're also going to see a lot more information flying at you when you try to make an order for an ETF. So as Dan alluded to, you're going to have on the order screen, not just the price or, you know, the price will be determined at the end of the day and you'll be surprised, hopefully happily, but uh, the price that updates in real time, second by second while the markets are open, or you'll have to guess what the price will be the next day if you're entering your order at night. Uh, and the price is not just going to be the price. You'll have the price someone's willing to pay to buy a share from you and the price someone is asking to uh, have their shares taken away. So if you want to buy a share right away, you have to pay the ask price. And then there's what's called the level two quotes, which then looks at what the next best offer to buy or sell is going down to cheaper and cheaper prices that someone's willing to pay to buy and higher and higher prices that someone is uh, willing to accept to sell their shares. Yeah, and then, all of which is to say there's a number of uh, yes. things on the screen flashing up when you're trying to place an order yeah. compared to a mutual fund, which, you know, as we said earlier, it's like, how much do you want to buy? $111.16, click. It's very simple. Yes. So, um, you know, if you're sensing a theme here, it's that as your options get cheaper, they also get a little bit more complicated to manage. So it really depends on the amount of effort that you're willing to put in. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So then the fourth option here uh, that you discuss in the new edition of the book, and this, you know, is really one we could do a whole podcast on, is robo-advisors. So let's just talk a little bit about how they fit into the picture. Um, sort of a hybrid between, you know, a hands-off mutual fund model and an ETF model. So where do they fit into the picture and, and you know, who is the right client for the robo-advisor? So the robo-advisors are a really nifty option. Uh, they're only a couple of years old in Canada now. And what they'll do is they will do all the work of buying those ETFs for you. Uh, they'll help create that um, asset allocation mix. And because they're uh, generally licensed portfolio managers, uh, they'll also do a tiny bit of financial planning with you and help decide on that mix for you. So you don't have to pick your asset allocation and which particular products will go into that. They'll pick the products for you uh, on your behalf. It's for people that want a solution 
that's more hands-off than some of the others. So it's sort of more comparable to what Tangerine might offer, uh, particularly when you're talking about investing in a registered account where you don't need to worry about the tax consequences of having a portfolio of 10 to 12 different ETFs. You know, we I get asked all the time, you know, about robo-advisors and, you know, why don't I recommend them? And And my answer is it's not that I don't recommend them. It's just I find it difficult to recommend one above the others. Um, and you're a sort of good person to talk to about this one because you don't have a vested interest like a lot of other people that, you know, you'll speak to about robo-advisors. But not only that, um, you actually co-created a online tool like a fee calculator um, that helps investors compare uh, the costs of robo-advisors, which is not necessarily as easy as it sounds. So why don't you talk a little bit about the tool and how it came about? Yeah, so the the problem with comparing the costs of robo advisors versus some of these other ones is particularly with ETFs with a essentially commission free model like a Quest Trade, you're always looking at a percentage. Tangerine has an MER, the TDE series have an MER, and you'll have to blend the TDE series. And with ETFs, you'll have to blend the MER depending on your asset allocation and what particular funds you pick. But you're always talking about just a straightforward percentage. So you can very quickly see, oh, Tangerine's 1.07% and TDE is you know, 0.45 depending on your asset allocation mix. And then you know, how much value am I getting for the simplicity versus how much work do I want to put in, et cetera. With a robo-advisor, now you have several moving parts coming into the cost. You have what the robo-advisor is charging as their headline fee, which first off isn't a simple percentage on its own. It's usually a percentage at some level up to some other level, and then the percentage changes. And some of them are marginal rates, so you'll still pay half a percent on the first 100000 or whatever their particular model is. And some of them are threshold rates. So as soon as you get up to a higher level, you pay that new rate on the entire amount of your uh, invested assets. And then you also have to pay fees for the ETFs that they put you in as well. And in some cases, particularly more so in the past uh, than today, the funds that they're selecting can be somewhat pricey. Um, a big consideration when Dan picks the funds that he puts into his model portfolio is simplicity, but also cost. So he's always putting very low cost products into that model portfolio. Uh, that is not necessarily the case for some of the ETF uh, selections that the robo-advisors are making because they're, in a lot of cases, slicing and dicing their portfolios to tweak their asset allocations or even try to engage in things like tactical asset allocation. Uh, so then there's those costs. And then finally, there's sometimes costs from the custodian broker that those uh, companies will pass along, such as trading costs or account administration costs or foreign exchange costs. And it can make comparing just how much one option costs versus another for you uh, quite difficult. And we found, uh, we, we being Sandy Martin and myself, found that you couldn't really do this in your head and you needed a tool. So we made a tool. Right. And where can you find the tool now? It's a, it's a website that you can visit and, and enter right. some uh, parameters and it'll, it'll give you some recommendations. Yep. So it's at mm -hmm. autoinvest.ca and there you'll see a picture of Justin and Kyle who are man managing it now as well as a picture of Sandy and myself who created the tool and uh, make sure that the math is checking out. And uh, then you can go to the calculator and enter, yeah, your parameters, how much you have to invest right now, how much you're going to be investing over the near future, just in case uh, one option might turn out to be better over the next couple of years versus just right now one is cheaper. And I really should put better in quotation marks there. Uh, again, those air quotes that you can't see over the audio only podcast, uh, because cost is just the starting point for your comparison. Yeah, there's, I mean, I would argue the same is true for discount brokerages, right? Is that um, certainly cost is, you know, perhaps the most important thing. Although if you're, you know, a couch potato investor and you're only making a couple of trades a year, you know, uh, trading fees are not likely to have a huge impact on what you do. And so you're going to want to look at other features that the brokerages have. And um, you've got an extra feature on the autoinvest.ca site that allows you to ask a few additional questions about the robo-advisors in addition to fees. So maybe you can explain a little bit about what some of the other parameters are. Yeah, so this is um, just a way to try to 
filter out the robo-advisor options if you have particular needs to make sure that they're going to be met. So if you're in a province, uh, I believe BC is one of them, that has a provincial grant for an RESP account, not all the robo-advisors will be able to get that extra grant for you. So you're probably, if you're looking to open a RESP account and live in BC, you're probably going to want one of the few that does. And so then if you check that box, it will limit your selections down to those robo-advisors that are part of that program. And if you have planning needs, because the robo-advisors are not always just an investment product solution, they uh, will often advertise that they can also provide some measure of planning. Well, what planning questions can they help you with? And that varies from each one. And so you can uh, select some boxes as to the typical planning questions that they might be able to help you with. So that if you want an all-in-one solution where it's not just the investment products, but also the planning, then you can uh, see which one is going to fit your needs there. All right, John, let's wrap up by talking about your new online course. Last year, you adapted the material in the value of Simple uh, to create a web-based course that you've called Practical Index Investing for Canadians. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the course and how it takes the lessons of the book a step further? Yeah, so uh, I got a number of questions from readers uh, looking for basically more and more and more detail and more and more and more help that didn't necessarily come across in the text-only form of the book. Um, and so I decided to create this course. So if you looked at you know one metric perhaps being word count, the book is about 45,000 words in the revised second edition, about 42 in the first. Uh, this is now about 100,000 words for uh, all the material in the course, from the videos to the text-based material, et cetera. Uh, so it's just the same sort of material, but more. And I really tried to expand on you know, the how-tos because I included some material on how you track your adjusted cost base for tax purposes and then how you report that on your Schedule 3. Well, now I've also included a sample T3 to see like what are the boxes that you're going to get uh, when your broker sends you this if you have a taxable account. Now, if you're investing just in an RSP or TFSA, you won't necessarily get into that. Uh, more details on how to make that choice between the RSP and TFSA and a lot more details on behavioral finance because that is such a key part. And in fact, actually, I'm not sure if uh, you had a chance to get to it. But toward the end of the course, I talk about uh, the move that you made from being Dan, the Canadian couch potato uh, journalist to an investment advisor because you were seeing so many people, and that was actually the topic of your podcast here, uh, one of the first episodes, so many people making so many behavioral mistakes in investing. And so I tried to really reinforce that message that you know being able to stick to it is going to be the hard part. So understanding how to do it is a barrier for people to get started. And, and that's a problem that I'm trying to solve, but that's just getting your foot in the door. To actually be successful at this, you need to not only know how to do it, but how to stick with it and not sort of trip over your own feet as you're doing this for uh, decades at a time. Yeah, that's always the hardest part. I find that it's, it's easy to become a couch potato investor. It's very hard to stay one for a long time. Yes. Um, but uh, one of the things that we... Um, you know, as I said, I really liked about the book was the the how-to advice that you did provide about getting started. And um, what I liked about the course too was that you took those instructions and put them in video form. So, and these are not just, you know, brief, you know, 90 second videos of uh, that glosses over things. I mean, you go into a lot of detail uh, with screenshots from Tangerine and TD and Questrade, et cetera, and kind of walk people through the process from opening an account transferring cash from your bank account to the investing account, placing the trades, right? So, I mean, that must have been a little bit of work to do it. But, <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, but, but rewarding in the sense that uh, now when people ask you those questions, you've got a kind of prepared answer that is going to be really helpful for them. Yeah, I, I like to think so. And yeah. uh, my great hope is that it will help people not just start investing. That's one of the great hopes. Um, but also to stay investing and to avoid some of those behavioral pitfalls so that in 10 years, I don't find myself applying to PWL to become a portfolio manager because, you know, people need the handholding of a portfolio manager to make it happen. Well, one of the perennial challenges that 
we always see, and I think you've done a really nice job in the, in the book and also um, in one of the videos in the courses, is just finding that right balance, right? Because both of us have written a lot about how people can optimize portfolios in ways to keep costs and taxes to an absolute minimum. But at the same time, recognizing that some people are going to try to do those things, tie themselves up in knots and probably cost themselves more than if they had just ignored the problem. So there is this balance that every investor needs to find between convenience and lowest possible cost in taxes. And for you, you know, as you described in this video, that's what optimization means. So do you want to just reflect on that a little bit and help people kind of find that balance for themselves? Yeah, exactly. And and, and that's what you said right there is, is the key is you have to find that balance for yourself. So for some investors who are really interested in saving every last penny, willing to put a lot of work and a lot of reading into it, um, because trying to optimize involves almost as much reading as all the rest of it combined. Because there are so many questions and so many variables that go into this. And some of it is involves some fortune telling as well. So then you also have to look at, you know, what's a reasonable projected rate of return for equities versus bonds. Because if you imagine that bonds and equities are going to have the same return, you'll get a different answer for what's optimal versus if you imagine that equities are going to have three or four times the return that bonds would. Uh, so that makes it a very difficult question to answer. So for some people, optimal is going to involve a lot of moving parts and a lot of tweaking things and putting uh, one type of asset into one type of account and a different one into a different account. Uh, for a lot of people though, that's just – it's a bridge too far. And you're going to have a lot more success for the long term by just focusing on keeping things simple, controlling the costs you can and are willing to control and then just letting the rest just go. Like – a well-diversified, balanced portfolio that isn't completely 100% tax optimized is not going to jeopardize your portfolio versus one that was completely optimized. We talk a lot about the importance of costs and how egregiously expensive the typical mutual fund is at the retail level here in Canada. But the difference between that sort of 2.4%, 2.5% MER on a mutual fund and even 1% on tangerine is huge. And that does make a difference to the quality of life that you might find in retirement after 30 years of compounding. Uh, the difference between using TDE series or a set of ETFs and then going to that extra mile of optimizing is really not going to affect that much. And and look at how much um, extra work it's going to take you. And if you're willing to do that, not just the first year, but forever to keep that maintained. And I find a lot of times when we really frame it that way, a lot of people say, well, I don't really need to optimize, optimize. Yeah. And if you could guarantee that there would be cost savings, it would be one thing. But as we've all seen, um, you know, having, you know, discussed things with DIY investors is, you can have a DIY investor who decides that they're ready to do the work of an ETF portfolio, but make so many costly mistakes, either trading too much or just administrative mistakes, they end up more than offsetting any savings they might have enjoyed in terms of fees. And so at the end of the day, they would have been better off with the simpler solution, right? Yeah. And again, that's simplicity, finding what's just complicated enough, just saving enough money for you that you can continue to manage is going to be an important point. I mean, there's no shame in using a robo-advisor or tangerine uh, if that's what's going to work best for you. I mean, recognize your own self and what you're going to be successful with long term and recognize that it does take more work to try to get more cost savings. Speaking of cost savings, uh, John, can you tell us about how much the course costs? Because it's got a little bit of an interesting story on how you set the price. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the course costs $299 as the sticker price. And that's what it was uh, since it was first launched uh, for the first year. And then I was having some trouble losing weight and sticking to my 2017 uh, New Year's resolution to get in better shape and lose weight. Uh, so partway through 2017, I made a commitment mechanism to myself, which is that I was going to commit to losing a certain amount of weight through the remainder of the year. And if I didn't, I would do something painful for myself. And part of that painfulness is that I was going to cut the costs on the book and the course. 
and I set an exponentially decreasing price for uh, linear decreases in weight. So because I lost some weight, um, but not as much as I had targeted, I've slashed the price from $299 to $169. So right now, if you're listening, the price is going to be $169. And it's going to stay that way until I manage to lose the weight that I've committed to lose. Uh, please do not send cookies. So that's just cheating. Yeah, I was going to suggest that you can send some uh, double cheese pizzas to John uh, a couple of weeks before you <laughs> apply for the course and hope for the best. So, yeah. uh, all right. Thanks so much, John. So if readers are looking for the book or the course or to get in touch with you, how's the best way? Way to do it. Uh, the best way is to go to the site valuesimple.ca, which is a site dedicated for the book. You can find the errata there. So as things change, and they inevitably do, uh, then you'll be able to see some updates that happen on there. And on the right-hand side, you'll see links to Indigo or my own uh, website or Kobo or uh, Amazon to be able to buy the book. And uh, also a little link on the bottom to go over to visit the course, which is at course.valuesimple.ca. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us, John. All right. Thanks for having me out. And it's time for Ask the Spud, the segment of the podcast where I answer questions about index investing from listeners and blog readers. Now, I get a lot of questions from investors, but I can't recall the last time I received so many of them about a single topic over such a short period. In late January, Vanguard Canada launched a new family of what they've called asset allocation ETFs. And immediately my inbox was filled with messages from people who wanted to know more about them. So I thought I would spend some time today discussing these ETFs in detail, and I hope this will give you a better sense of whether they're right for you. Now we need to start with a description of what these new ETFs are and why they've generated so much interest. In my interview with John Robertson, we discussed the various options for building an index portfolio. And the simplest one was the Tangerine Investment Funds, because these provide one-stop shopping. Each one is a mutual fund that holds bonds, Canadian stocks, U.S. stocks, and international stocks in a single product. So you don't need to manage several moving parts, and you don't ever need to rebalance the portfolio because that's done for you automatically. Compare that to my ETF portfolio, which includes three individual funds, one for bonds, one for Canadian stocks, and then a third one that combines U.S. and international stocks. To build and maintain a portfolio like this, you need to be comfortable buying three different funds on the stock exchange, and whenever you add new money, you need to decide which ETF you should add to, and then from time to time, you need to rebalance the portfolio, and that's going to involve selling one or more funds and using the proceeds to top up whatever is furthest below your long-term targets. As John and I discussed, there's a trade-off here. The balanced fund option is extremely low maintenance, but the cost of the tangerine funds is just over 1%, which is on the high side for index funds. By comparison, managing three ETFs is significantly more work, but if you're willing and able to do that, you can lower your cost significantly to about 0.15% or so, plus the cost of any trading commissions you might incur. Now you might ask, how come no one has created a balanced ETF that combines the best of both worlds? And it could hold all of the asset classes in a single fund, so you wouldn't need to rebalance, but it would also offer the same low fees that we've come to expect from ETFs. Well, that's a great question, and I should say there have been a few such ETFs that have been around for a while, but in my opinion, none of them are very good. Usually they have too many fringe asset classes, and they're not even particularly cheap. All of which brings us to the newly launched products from Vanguard. For the first time, an ETF provider in Canada has created a family of ETFs that includes only traditional index funds in the core asset classes and package these together for a very low fee. Vanguard calls these asset allocation ETFs and they're available in three flavors. The first is the balanced ETF portfolio with the ticker symbol VBAL. It is 60% equities and 40% bonds, so this is the classic balanced portfolio that's a good starting point for the average mid-career investor with a modest risk tolerance. Then there's the growth ETF portfolio, the ticker is VGRO, which is 80% equities, so this would be suitable for younger, more aggressive investors. And then finally there's the conservative ETF portfolio, ticker symbol VCNS, with a target of 60% bonds and 40% equities. 
The asset mix in these new ETFs is quite similar to what's in my model portfolios. On the equity side, I typically recommend keeping equal amounts of Canadian, US, and international stocks. And the Vanguard funds are roughly 30% Canada, 38% US, and 32% international. So not a huge difference, and certainly a reasonable blend of global stocks. For the fixed income, the Vanguard ETFs include a mix of Canadian, U.S., and international bonds, rather than holding only Canadian bonds like all of the options in my model portfolios do. I don't think this adds any meaningful amount of diversification, and if anything, it's likely to lower the yield slightly, but over the long term, it's not likely to make a meaningful difference, so I would consider this something of a quibble. As for the cost, well, each of these three ETFs has a management fee of just 0.22%. So once we include taxes, we should expect the full MER on these funds to be about 25 basis points. That is much cheaper than any balanced fund available in Canada, which explains all of the excitement. Within hours of the launch of these products, I heard from dozens of investors who wanted to know whether these new ETFs made all the other options obsolete. I mean, why would anyone bother with Tangerine anymore or the TDE series funds or even a portfolio of three or four individual ETFs? While we're at it, why would anyone use a robo-advisor and pay their additional fee of half a percent or so when you can get ETFs and automatic rebalancing with these new Vanguard funds at much lower cost? Well, These are all fair questions, and it's certainly true that the new asset allocation ETFs would be a better alternative for many investors. But there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all investment solution. So let's dig a little deeper here and help you decide whether these new Vanguard products are indeed the right choice for your portfolio. Let's start with a discussion of fees. Anytime we're making comparisons of annual fees, we need to understand the differences in dollar terms, not just percentages. And to do that, we need to consider the size of the portfolio. Keeping costs low is important for every investor, but seeking the lowest possible fees is less important for those who have relatively small portfolios. And to return to what John Robertson and I discussed in our interview, it's often worth it for many investors to pay a little more for convenience and simplicity. The annual fee on the Vanguard Asset Allocation ETFs will be about 0.25%, which is about half as much as a portfolio of TDE series funds and about one-fourth as much as the Tangerine Investment Funds. Now, those differences sound very large, but if your portfolio is small, the difference may not be as much in dollar terms as you think. So here's a rule of thumb that you can use when considering whether to switch from one of these mutual fund options to the Vanguard ETFs. Switching out of the E-Series funds to the Asset Allocation ETFs will save you less than $2 a month for every $10,000 you have invested. Switching from the Tangerine funds will save you closer to $7 a month. So if your portfolio is $50,000 and you're using the TDE Series funds, then migrating to one of these new Vanguard ETFs will save you about $10 a month. Now, that's not zero, but neither is it going to make the difference between your success and failure as an investor. If you're thinking about switching from Tangerine with that $50,000, then your cost savings would be more like $34 a month. So that's starting to sound more compelling. If your portfolio is less than $50,000, well, it's up to you to decide whether it's worth making the switch to save those few dollars a month, but at least take the time to do the calculations first. And remember, too, that these differences include only the management fees. So if you're switching to ETFs, you'll also be paying a commission on every trade, unless you use a brokerage such as Questrade that allows commission-free ETF purchases. So even a couple of $10 trading commissions can wipe out the cost advantage of ETFs on small portfolios. A second important consideration is whether you're making regular contributions to your accounts. This is a great way to save with discipline, and I strongly recommend it for anyone who has a regular paycheck. And for those who are making regular contributions, index mutual funds are ideal because you can automate the process using what's called a pre-authorized contribution plan or a systematic investment plan, basically two terms for the same thing. And they simply mean that a certain amount of money comes out of your bank account at regular intervals and is automatically invested in your mutual funds with no fees or commissions. Robo-advisors may also be a good choice for people making these kinds of regular contributions because many of them will invest every small amount automatically without additional cost. 
Now, unfortunately, this isn't possible if you've built your own portfolio from ETFs. So if you're using a brokerage such as Questrade, where you don't pay commissions to purchase ETFs, you still need to log in every month and place a trade manually. Now, this isn't a huge amount of work, but the fact is, and I know this for a fact, many investors don't do it regularly. And even when they do, they often get distracted by what's happening in the markets. They start to wonder, should I really invest this new cash now? Or maybe I should wait a few days and you get the picture. So my point is, if you've already set up automatic contributions and you like being a hands-off investor, then switching to ETFs, even a one-fund solution like Vanguard's, might throw a wrench into your plans, and it's not worth it to save a small amount in MER. The next question to ask yourself, do you have any experience trading ETFs? So if you've been using index mutual funds and you've never placed trades on an exchange, you should be aware that there is a learning curve here. Do you, for example, know the difference between a bid price and an ask price? Between a market order and a limit order? Are you aware that you should only enter orders when the markets are open between 9.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern Time? If all of this is news to you, then take some time to learn these trading basics before you liquidate those index funds and embrace ETFs, because a few costly trading errors can quickly eat up any fee savings that you might otherwise enjoy. It's also very important to consider how many and what types of accounts you have. So if you're investing only in a TFSA or an RSP, or even both, then the new Vanguard ETFs are an excellent choice. But if you're using a non-registered or taxable account, then they're not the best option. And that's because all three of the new ETFs hold traditional bond ETFs as underlying holdings, and these are quite tax inefficient. Now, I should say this is also true of the tangerine funds, which are less than ideal in taxable accounts. But in my experience, most people who have taxable accounts have already maxed their TFSAs and RSPs, which means their portfolios are probably quite large. And at that point, tangerine isn't likely to be that popular with them anyway. The TD E-Series bond fund is tax inefficient too, but an E-Series portfolio is built from individual funds. So you have the flexibility to set up the portfolio in such a way that, say, the bond fund is in the RSP and the equity funds are in your non-registered account. The key point here is that if you have multiple accounts, a TFSA, an RSP, a taxable account, not to mention a spouse who might also have the same multiple accounts, then a one-fund solution is probably not ideal for you. More complex situations require a little more flexibility than a balanced ETF can offer. Now, so far, we've talked about switching out of index mutual funds that are more expensive than the Vanguard asset allocation ETFs. But I've also received a number of questions from investors who are currently using my three ETF model portfolio, and they're considering switching to a single ETF solution, even though it's slightly more expensive. And this is because they wisely recognize the behavioral advantages of a single balanced ETF. So let's talk about those for a minute. Many investors find it difficult to rebalance their portfolios with discipline. And when you think about it, this really isn't surprising. Rebalancing usually means selling asset classes that have been the best recent performers and then using the proceeds to buy the ones that everyone currently hates. And if your portfolio holds several ETFs, how did you feel about selling stocks as they've soared over the last several years and then using that cash to buy more bonds whose returns have been disappointing? So if you can't bring yourself to do this consistently, then using one of the Vanguard asset allocation ETFs will impose that discipline on you. And those few extra basis points of MER are worth it if they save you from making poor rebalancing decisions. The same is true if you're prone to tinkering with your asset mix. And you know what I mean here. You build your portfolio using only three or four core funds, but then you decide you can improve it by adding a dividend fund, maybe a sector fund, maybe some gold or a few random stocks even. Now, this kind of tinkering is a huge distraction, and it almost never improves your long-term performance. Switching to a one-fund portfolio doesn't guarantee that you won't be tempted to do a little freelancing, but it might help you stay focused on the bigger picture rather than those small details on the fringes. Along the same lines, a balanced fund has the advantage of reporting only a single rate of return every year. With a balanced portfolio, that return is likely going to be modestly positive most years, and that's probably going to be encouraging to you. Compare that with a portfolio built from several funds. 
Well, now you're going to be focused on the returns of individual asset classes. You know, bonds were slightly negative last year, international stocks outperformed Canada, and so on. And once again, you'll be tempted to change your asset mix rather than accepting that the whole reason we diversify is because no one can predict what the next outperforming asset class is going to be. Finally, I think it's worth noting that the Vanguard asset allocation ETFs are really best suited to investors who want to hold either 60% or 80% equities because those are the targets for the balanced and growth versions of the funds, the ones with the tickers VBAL and VGRO. If your target allocation is 50% stocks or 70% stocks, then there isn't an ETF with either of those asset classes. And the conservative version, VCNS, with its 60% bonds and just 40% equities, in my opinion, is not as attractive as the other two, with all of those U.S. and global bonds making up a pretty large portion of the fund. If you're a conservative investor with that much fixed income, I'd suggest you consider adding some GICs to your portfolio instead of holding 60% bonds. So I hope all of this has made it clear that the Vanguard Asset Allocation ETFs are excellent products, maybe even the most useful ETFs to appear in the past couple of years. But they definitely haven't made all of the other options obsolete. So before you cash out your carefully built index fund portfolio and pour everything into one of these new ETFs, take some time to understand the all-in costs and the trade-offs involved in making the switch. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Canadian Couch Potato Podcast. A shout out to the people who keep us on the air, especially Nick Jaworski, our producer, and Hunter McKinnon at Truly Social for coordinating everything behind the scenes. If you enjoy the podcast, please take a few moments to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, which helps spread the word. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.